Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to talk about how I made this portal here with its swirly lines and things. It's a two part series, the first part I'll be talking about the base and the second part I'll be talking about those swirly lines. It is a time lapse but I've only speeded it up to 400% so it's four times as quick as normal and I think I speed it up a little bit quicker uh, when I get into some of the painting work where it's a bit sort of samey. But I start off with a sculpt. You can just as easily do this with a cylinder and I was testing this for the game I'm doing Atlas Empires and they needed a sort of stone base for one of their objects. So I was just sort of playing around and testing and this time I did a sculpt. The next time I actually did a cylinder and it was, it was a lot quicker. So I wouldn't really recommend this but you can get more shape and uh, more sort of variation I suppose with the sculpt. It's a bit more natural and you can play a bit more with it but a cylinder is a lot quicker. If people want to, I will upload the model so you can sort of have a go at painting along with me if you like. Uh, just comment below and let me know. Make sure you're saving your work regularly, you can see what I'm doing here. <laughs> I always save my work every time I go into a sort of major change, so I'm about to decimate the rock base, so I save my work but I also save the shape so you can see it's got a backup there a little backup collection and I put the original in there and then I can apply the decimate modifier I quite like that workflow really sculpt and then decimate it creates nice sort of organic shapes I suppose I'm just tidying the mesh up I think I mirror it as well just to speed that process up uh, but just tidying the shape up so that there's not too many tight faces uh, especially sort of long triangles can be a bit annoying when you're painting. They can uh, create a bit uh, a sort of few glitches and things. But yeah, so you can see I've sort of mirrored it there and just uh, deleting bits. Making sure the base is all level at the bottom because there's no need to have sort of uh, lumpiness there, especially if it's on top of something. If it's a game asset, it's bound to be on some sort of ground surface. So you need all the bottom, bottom edges to be flat. So select them all and scale in the Z0. So nothing too complicated here. And just merging these vertices together. Which is a tiny bit awkward uh, until you find that there is a merge, um, auto merge option. Uh, so in the sort of workspace tool settings you can get the auto merge in there uh, when you're snapping two vertices. Took me a while to find that. So into the UV editing, I actually apply the mirror at this point because I want a nice big base so I can uh, have fun with this rather than having to mirror. Because mirroring is uh, useful if you've got only a small texture space, so I'm having to do that a lot with my Atlas Empires work. But if you can afford the texture space, which I'm doing here, then uh, don't mirror. You can always mirror when you're painting, which is what I'll do in a moment. So just setting it up, I thought about doing a UV smart UV project that is, but then I thought actually it's much easier because it's fairly sort of cylindrical just to do a few seams in it and then spread it out like this. If I need to then I can paint on my actual UV editor or workspace in that side. <laughs> I was using uh, a new tablet just to test it out and this is probably where most people have seen this before, uh, but I was testing the Gammon tablet and it's quite tricky to split the windows with these tablets uh, so you can see the limitations to those tablets there. When I first start most objects I like to just blob on a few different colors to get a bit of variation that sort of organic feel. I don't uh, like to start with one solid color and then start painting the detail onto it so go around keep changing the color and sort of blob uh, spots on it and that sort of thing. And it gives it a sort of stony look then. And change the colour, vary your colour lots. Uh, that does help. It, it's the fact that rocks are sort of natural and they have different colours for one, but they also pick up slight reflections as well uh, from the surrounding um, sort of colours um, that are in its vicinity. I use the smear brush to sort of tidy up. That's a limitation of Blender that it doesn't really like uh, when you're painting from one side and you sort of overlap geometry. Uh, you can see there's bit of sort of um, glitches there and things. I'm not sure whether other software is better for that. Um, I only use Blender for texture painting. I would like to try out some other software and see what it's like uh, because there are certain 
limitations to Blender's painting, like layers are really awkward, for example. So the first thing I do is to just mark out the shape. It's like I'm uh, drawing this as if it was a piece of art or something in Photoshop. You just draw out your, your basic outline first, see where the rocks are going to go. I can change them all a bit later and adapt them, but I'm just getting a rough idea of where I want them to be, how big I want them to be, and uh, whether they fit together well. Now you can see that I've got mirror turned on there, so I've got it in just the x-axis at the moment. And that's just to speed up my workflow. I only have to paint half, and then I'll go into that sort of mirrored area later on and tidy it up. I wish actually I'd gone into that a bit more because it still looks a bit symmetrical when you're looking around the shape and things. But it does speed up your workflow, it is much faster. You can see that I've turned on X and Y mirror here when I'm doing this sort of um, next inside bit here. And you can't really tell too much with that. I did modify that shape a lot more than I modified the base mirror. But you can always turn the mirror off. That's the advantage of using the mirror in the painting mode rather than mirror when you're mirroring your object. Obviously, if you've got a mirrored object, you've got much more in terms of pixels to play with because you're only on a quarter of the space. But you can always use the uh, mirror in the paint tools uh, if you want to use that sort of mirror option. It especially helped here with that sort of middle section and the sort of symmetry around it there. I found the metal quite tough. I'm still working on that. The metal um, textures are really tough to get right, I think. And some people do them immensely well. I'm sort of, more of a stone and wood person, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I've got to develop my skills a lot more uh, with the metal. It's nice to have the opportunities to do more painting, actually. So once I've got that basic outline, then it's filling in the colours. It's the same way you would if you were doing this in Photoshop, really. You sort of block in colours, uh, get the rough shape first, block in colours, uh, and then sort of slowly build up the detail. And I think I've still got X mirror turned on. Yes, I have. Um, so I'm only doing half. But you can see the effects of the mirror when you come together, and that it doesn't look very nice. It looks really obviously mirrored. And you must go in and sort of sort that out later. And it's very tricky when you've got a mirrored mesh, uh, which is actually properly mirrored, so uh, you can't sort of adapt that. Uh, it's very difficult to try and get rid of those mirrored areas, and you have to be really subtle with the way they join together. Avoid it where you can, but if your UVs, uh, your UV maps are only small, then you'll have to use mirroring quite a lot. So I'm starting to add the detail here, as you can see. Just going in, um, adding sort of uh, cracks to the rocks, that sort of vibrancy. It's interesting really how far you need to go with this sort of thing. You've got to think how close you're going to get to this object, how big is the object in the scene, because you don't want to spend ages painting something when it's not really going to be visible. A lot of the work I'm doing for Atlas Empires at the moment, because the UV maps are so small, when I'm painting this sort of detail, uh, it goes really pixelated, so there's just no point in going that close. Or that fine, I should say, I suppose. Always using the uh, screen and multiply brushes. That just seems the easiest way with Blender. It's not really a, a workflow that I like that much. I prefer to actually colour pick and then use the colours and then brighten them and darken them and add a bit of saturation sometimes or less saturation if I'm going lighter. And I do that with sort of uh, using the Alt key in Photoshop samples, but Blender doesn't really have that option. You can sample a colour, but then you have to go into the colour palette and then use it, and that's too slow. So the screen and multiply brush is a bit faster. And that's the way I'm getting the sort of light and dark patches and things. You just got to change your brush strength and then you can get sort of subtle effects. You can really see the effect of the mirror just there, can't you? And that's when I'll have to go in later and sort of tidy that up. There's always a tricky bit when you're trying to figure out when to go more detailed and when not to. And that's something you get with experience. A lot of the time I see amateurs and they're sort of working on a, a piece in isolation and going into loads of detail with that and then suddenly they've got to 
mess it up because they're trying to add uh, color to the whole thing. So it's really important that you take your time with each stage and then think, right, I'm ready to go to the next level of detail, bring down the brush size and then start working. If you're bringing down the brush size, think, do I need to bring it down now or can I leave it big and do some more sort of um, general details rather than fine details. So here I am on the sort of meta metallic bit in the middle here. And for metal, uh, you have very fine and uh, small highlights. Uh, and you can see I'm going around the ridge of the metal and, and adding in that highlight. The other thing with metal is that the highlights usually are the same color as your base metal. So if it's gold, your highlights are going to be slightly yellow, uh, which is different for dielectric materials or non-metallic materials where highlights are usually just sort of white and, uh, or reflective and reflect the colors around it. So that's uh, why we have a sort of metallic slider in things like the BSDF shader, because it has that sort of property to it. I think I may have gone overboard in some of those highlighted areas. I adapt it later on, but you can sort of see uh, it doesn't quite look like metal at the moment, certainly not. I'm still using that X and Y mirror on the middle here. I think that really helps speed things up. But you'll see in a second, when I start painting some detail into the rocks, they need to be a bit more or a bit less uniform, so or more individual, I should say. Uh, so you can really start seeing the mirror and uh, the effect it's having there. I change that later on. I actually use a, a texture mask here just to give it a sort of rough, rugged edge to the, um, the gold as if it's worn slightly. I'm just testing things out again. I t tend to not use them that much really, but it's very handy uh, to have a sort of texture mask, uh, like Photoshop brushes really. Uh, but I'm one of those people who just sort of sticks to one brush over and over again. I really ought to diversify on those sort of things really. I'm sure it will help my artwork. So I'm up to 600% in this bit. So when I'm going into the detail, I take a little bit longer to sort of uh, work on it and get those sort of shapes right. But it can be a little bit more boring to look at. You see, I'm using a white highlight here and I don't think that's right. And I think that's where it goes a bit wrong. You do have really strong, tiny highlights, uh, which might be um, sort of clo close to white anyway. Uh, you should never really go fully white or fully black uh, because then you kind of lose any um, sort of option to play with it, um, if that makes sense. So in post, you want to have that little bit of area to play with if you want to bring down the blacks. Uh, if you've got one patch that's already fully black, you can't bring it down any further. So never go fully white or fully black. And generally, things aren't fully white or fully black anyway, so you shouldn't really be going there. If you look at my node editor at the moment, you can see that I've got the texture plugged into the principled BSDF shader. And actually, I prefer to plug it into an emission. So if you're using the node wrangler, you can press Control shift on your texture, and that will give you an emission node with a strength of 1. And that will tell you exactly what's going to be like without the influence of an HDRI. You can see now I'm adding a bit more gold, a goldy colour, to the uh, the gold and it's it's turning out a lot better so I'm taking out some of those highlights really and adding a bit of yellow to them I should have gone further with that and taken more of those highlights out so those white edges I should have gone over with a bit of yellow and I think it would have looked better so now I'm looking at those mirrored patches and tidying them up a bit I'm just using the um, smudge brush and that's not a good approach really it'd be nice if there was a sort of warp and shift brush actually uh, in Blender, but there isn't. So it would have been better if I'd sorted this out much earlier. It's again that thing about knowing when to add the detail and when to modify shapes, and in this case, when to start thinking about your mirror and messing up the mirror so it doesn't look symmetrical. You can see I'm just going in and kind of adding contrast, the sort of ambient occlusion areas, and filling those in. I probably should have gone a sort of more saturated color rather than what looks to be more just a black at the moment. Can you see in my color wheel there it's somewhere really close to the center and maybe the saturation should uh, be up a little bit from there is it looks very sort of gray rather than uh, vibrant. Understanding color is really important it's something that I've got to work on a lot uh, there's lots to think about with color 
in terms of reflections, ambient light, and uh, there's just all sorts going on in the shadows and the saturation. And it's well worth looking into tutorials just based on color theory. And there's some amazing artists out there, not necessarily 3D, of course, uh, but they'll talk about color and they'll have some excellent advice. If this is something you want to get into, then you must look at other artists, 2D artists especially, and those sort of people have spent years and years just working with things like colour and understanding colour, so uh, you really need to look at their work and try and understand uh, how that works. So that's the end result. Uh, I'm pleased with how it turned out. Uh, next session is the um, swirly weird bits, which I'll talk about and break down how I did that. Thanks for watching, and I hope this helps.